Good morning and welcome back. I hope you guys had a good break. Today, um, we'll start with chapter six on learning. Let's take a look at the course schedule in the syllabus, which I have adapted as shown with those colored blocks. So um, today we're at the 27th and we will cover chapter six over four lectures. So I have um, 50 slides and I'll, I'll try to get to slide 18 today to cover classical conditioning. So I'm, I'm going to play something for you. And now those of you who watch these recordings won't be able to see the video because Microsoft Teams doesn't record um, a video within my lecture video, but I will put a little hovering card that you can click in order to watch it. But for those of you who are um, here live today, um, I'm going to ask you pay attention to What's going on in your body when uh, when I play this? Does that make you salivate? <laughs> I get quite a strong condition response to that. So, but sometimes when I do these little in-class demonstrations, they don't work out. So I don't know if if that happened for any of you, but um, for some of you, perhaps the the sound of that beeping is conditioned to to food that you would have um, would have re received afterwards. I see a comment there. First of all, you should have stopped the microwave before the timer goes off. Oh, so maybe there's there's more that you get that would happen after this like the sign of sound of the door opening that you get conditioned to is that am i getting your point nelson <laughs> yeah i just sort of put in random numbers and then leave it in for a bit and stop it also randomly All right, so it says that uh, it activates Nelson's fight or flight responses. So if you had some reaction to that, that's an example of, of learning. And learning is the process of changing your knowledge or behavior because of your experience. So this is distinct from instinct. Instincts are hardwired and unlearned. Um, you know, cats chase stuff because of instinct, not because they were taught to do so. But learning is about changing your knowledge or your behavior because of your experience. And it's connected to instinct. You know, we learn things that we're primed to learn, but um, it's more than, than instinct. And this can happen a few different ways. So you can learn because something happened to you. You can learn because you listened in, in lecture or read a book. And you can learn because you saw someone else doing something. Now, we've defined um, learning as changing your behavior because of, of instinct. And that does not not require cognition. There are cognitive forms of learning, but the most basic form of learning, which is associative, does not require cognition. So learning can be studied at a purely behavioral level without invoking higher processes of, of cognition of thought. And very, very simple creatures like sea slugs can learn, right? So that learning can happen at a very low level without conscious awareness. So if you shoot a sea slug with a jet of water, it'll, it'll contract, just like you'd startle if there was a sudden noise. And, but if the sea slug keeps getting shot with that jet of water, it doesn't keep reacting the way it did the first time. You know, maybe the second time there's there's a big reaction, but, you know, the third time, the fourth time, it's going to sort of stop reacting. And if I continue to make a, a startling noise, you'd react the first time. And then if I did it three times, five times, you, you get used to it. And so that's learning because the sea slug or you changed your behavior because of experience. And. You also may have realized um, that, that getting sprayed with water is is no big deal. And so it doesn't need to expend energy in 
into avoiding it. So the sea slug learned. Um, I shouldn't have used the word realize there because that sounds like a higher level of, of cognition, realizing, insight, aha moment. And, and sea slugs don't have much in the way of a brain or, or arguably consciousness. Now, when you're studying or listening in a class, you're learning in, in a really explicit way and, and you're conscious of your learning. But you, just like the sea slug, can also learn implicitly. So maybe you had some reaction to the microwave beeping there um, or that example of habituation and, and that you might um, not notice uh, a noisy fan in a room anymore. So there, some of the most basic principles of learning are habituation and sensitization. We were talking about habituation there, right? So the, the sea slug that is not responding as intensely to a jet of water is habituating to it, right? If a, an initially startling noise is repeated, you're not startled anymore, that's habituation. There's another process that is called sensitization. And that's the, the reverse. That's when you actually get a bigger response as, as something can be repeated. And we see these happen in, in different contexts. The adaptive value of habituation is that you stop responding to a stimulus in your environment that's not really important. So you can keep focusing on what is important. You stop um, you know, burning calories, noticing that. But then what if there's something in your environment that is sort of threatening or irritating? Then you get sensitized to it and start noticing it um, more and more. I experienced this with uh, whispering in, in the lecture hall. Um, if I notice student whispering, and, and it upsets me a bit because it, um, I record lectures and it makes it more difficult to, to edit the video. And, uh, and so it ticks me off a bit. And then I, I notice it to the point that it, it sounds like it's like stabbing my ears. I see a, a comment there. If you were to not use the water on the sea slug for an hour or so after it stops reacting so much, do you know if it would go back to larger reactions if you started back up again? That's a good question. I do not know the answer. Um, I speculate that it wouldn't, you would get a larger response, but it might not be as big as the first one. And there's a, another question. Do either of these processes pay, play a role in PTSD or trauma responses? I wonder about um, sensitization. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, when we talk about con uh, classical conditioning, I'll bring up second order conditioning. And I suspect that triggers are an example of that. So association is the, the fundamental principle of learning. It's, it's about connecting one thing to, to another. And the, the simplest form of, of learning is, is classical conditioning. And what happens there is that animals come to respond to a previously neutral stimulus that's been paired with another stimulus that's associated with some kind of instinctive primal response as if it's um, where what we call the unconditioned stimulus. I'll, I'll go over that, that in, in more detail. So an unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus, a thing that your body responds to innately in a certain way. So meat is an unconditioned stimulus that naturally makes dogs salivate. Okay, so it's about an, a natural, primal, instinctive response. But what if every time before we gave the dog meat, we sounded a tone? 
the dog does have a natural response to the sound of a tone and it's probably to prick up its ears and you know orient its head and be like you know what's that where did that come from but it would not be natural for a dog to salivate to a tone that's just not how it works but let's say we pair the tone and the food over many trials the tone is going to start to have this predictive value because right? it means that the food is coming and what we see is that the dog will learn to salivate to the tone even though that's not a natural response to a tone but that's happening because we've been established that there is an association between the tone and food and salivation is the unconditioned response to to food Um, so here is some some terminology for for classical conditioning, and one of them is is neutral stimulus, and that's like the tone we were talking about. And I want to qualify that it is neutral from the perspective of the researcher who's studying and interested in a particular phenomenon. Uh, Pavlov was interested in in digestion. That's what he studied, and he's looking for the response of, of salivation. Um, in that context, a tone is a neutral stimulus because it doesn't make you salivate. But of course, it is associated with some kind of response, which is probably to um, just notice the sound, right? Orient its ears, to have the dog um, move its ears. But that's not what Pavlov's interested in. And, that, in, and so that's why we're calling it, it's a neutral stimulus. It's a neutral stimulus with regard to digestive processes. The unconditioned stimulus, the UCS, is the stimulus that elicits an unconditioned response. It's um, the stimulus naturally produces some kind of primal response, okay? Salivation is a natural response to to food okay so food could be a ucs and salivation would be the unconditioned response you can think of other ones um let's say electric shock that naturally elicits the startle response so the unconditioned response to the unconditioned stimulus of an electric shock is a startle response the condition stimulus is the one it is what we've been been pairing okay so if we pair a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus then over time the animal will learn to respond to the neutral stimulus as, as if it were the unconditioned stimulus. But we don't call it a neutral stimulus anymore because it's no longer neutral, right? The, the dog is salivating to the tone. So now it becomes the conditioned stimulus. So after conditioning, the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. And it elicits a conditioned response. Salivation to a tone is a conditioned response, not a natural unconditioned response. And I see a question there in the chat. They talked about this in the office when Jim played a prank with, with mints on right. Yes, um, I heard about that and uh, another student said that in, in a previous intro site class and I hadn't seen it and the person sent me the clip and, and it was quite funny and I should find, find it again and, and share it with you guys. So the phase during which the, the dog is learning that uh, the tone is paired with, with food is called acquisition. Right? They're acquiring the conditioned response. But now what would happen if we kept sounding the tone and stopped providing the food? Initially, the, the dog would keep responding the way it's it's learned to. It would salivate. But over subsequent trials, it would learn that this isn't the stimulus isn't predictive anymore. And it would stop salivating or, or it wouldn't it would lose that response. That's called extinction. 
extinction is not the same thing as unlearning something. The animal doesn't seem to forget the original pairing. And we know that because um, after some time, let's say you were to present the tone again, the dog might salivate. So the response isn't gone. It didn't disappear. And this can particularly happen um, in new contexts. Okay, so that, that's called spontaneous recovery. Okay, so you think you've extinguished the, this response and it pops up again. And this can particularly happen in, in new settings. Right, that are different from the one that the stimulus, the, 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 the association was extinguished in. So what that tells us is that we're not unlearning the original association. It's like we're learning a second thing, and it's that this doesn't really work anymore in this context. But hey, maybe it'll work in, in another context. Maybe it'll work later. And so it, it springs up again. Stimulus generalization is when similar conditioned stimuli elicit the same conditioned response as the original conditioned stimuli. So an example of that is the famous Little Albert experiment where uh, little Albert was taught to fear rats like which are white fluffy things and albert also showed fear to um other white fluffy things to a santa beard and to uh the, the psychologist's hair okay so because those are, are white fluffy things they're similar to rats and albert responded to them in a similar way and so the Pavlov's dogs, who were conditioned to salivate to a certain tone, also salivated to similar tones, but a little bit less than to the original tone. And the further and further away the tone got, the less and less they responded. And that is called stimulus discrimination. Okay, so stimulus discrimination and is when we exhibit the conditioned response to, to certain stimuli when, and not to others. Now, some stimuli um, are resistant to conditioning. Pavlov was able to condition dogs to salivate to a tone. So the tone worked as a conditioned stimulus. But there are other things that he could have done that might not have worked as well, like maybe patting them on the head. Because if they get patted on the head a lot, that's not a stimulus that has good predictive validity. Right? That happens so much in so many different contexts that it's not as useful um, for as, as a signal. Okay, So a tone that they're not used to hearing, like I suppose if you used a metronome or something like that, um, is a novel stimulus. And so it works really well as a signal with a particular meaning. So what are things that, that we see, see a lot of that would probably be resistant to conditioning? It would be hard to condition anything to a response to seeing a sidewalk because you see them all the time, right? Or to chairs and tables or to vinyl tiles or to laptops even if you've had a let's say a, a traumatic online experience something like uh, i don't know cyberbullying or, or workplace harassment um, it's unlikely that your response to that is conditioned to, to laptops in general maybe it would be to the company inbox, Outlook inbox with its logo, which is a, a better predictor of, of trouble, but it'd be unlikely to happen to something that we see a lot of in many different contexts, like, you know, computers or, or phones. Now, let's talk about higher order conditioning. So we talked about 
how how conditioning turns a neutral stimulus into a conditioned stimulus by pairing it with um, an unconditioned stimulus. But let's say that after pairing the tone with food and after clearly establishing the tone as a conditioned stimulus that elicits salivation, what if we then paired a light with a tone? So that now the order is light, tone, and food. If presenting the light alone elicited salivation, then higher order conditioning has occurred. That's an example of um, second order conditioning. And um, there was a question about uh, from Michaela about uh, PTSD or trauma responses. And I, I wonder whether trauma triggers are examples of higher order conditioning. Because if somebody's had a, a traumatic experience, there might have been, you know, you might they might see things in their current environment that remind them of what happened to them in a different environment and still elicit that, that fear response. So I, I wonder, I don't know, but uh, I speculate that, that those are examples. Um, okay. Conditioned response. Oh, sorry. I knew I was forgetting something. And another example of a, a higher order conditioned stimulus are, are words. Words as are, are sounds, but they're associated with the thing. And sometimes you might have a response to hearing a word. Right? If somebody says lemonade and that makes you feel thirsty, that's an example of second order conditioning because lemonade activate the word lemonade is a sound that activates the concept that's paired with the the actual physical thing. Um, conditioned responses become weaker the further and further they get from the original um, conditioned stimulus. So if, if you are pairing, let's say, a tone with, with food, a dog's response would be strongest to the tone and of salivation, I'm sorry, it would be strongest to the tone. And now say you paired a light with the tone and then you presented the light alone, it would salivate less to that than to the tone. And then let's say you tried to do third order conditioning and um, I don't know what you do, you do something else before you show show the, the light. If you could condition, if you could even succeed in conditioning that response, it would be even weaker. There are many, many applications of classical conditioning. Um, advertisers will try to pair their products with stimuli that elicit positive emotions in you. Makes me wonder whether they think that, that horniness is a positive emotion because they use sex a lot. Um, the goal is to get the consumer to associate the brand with a particular feeling. And these images here of smiling people evoke a response in you. So you see these smiling happy people and maybe you feel warm and fuzzy and now you're associating that with Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola, um, Coca-Cola's advertising strategy is to pair it with happiness and satisfaction. They used to actually put cocaine in it, but they don't do that anymore. So classical conditioning helps us explain how we can acquire some fears and phobias. There's that um, famous little Albert experiment that you read about in your textbook where the researchers were able to teach little Albert to fear rats and even other white fuzzy things by pairing the presentation of the rat, which she was not 
scared of at the beginning with a loud sound. They, they struck a bar that was behind his head. And after a few pairings like that, he cried as soon as he saw the rat. So uh, there is a strategy, a related strategy for helping people over get over their phobias that's called systematic desensitization therapy. And the, the way that works is by um, teaching a client to associate the feared stimulus with relaxation. Relaxation is the opposite of, of anxiety. They're incompatible responses. And so how, how might that happen? Let's say somebody is phobic of spiders. Right? How are you going to pair spiders with relaxation? Well, you might start by, let's say in an early session, by um, relaxing the client, right? Maybe go through some steps to get the, I don't know, deep breathing or whatever it might be. And then once they're in that relaxed state, you introduce the stimulus. You don't like drop a spider down their shirt. That, that wouldn't work. But um, you might start trying to get them comfortable with hearing the word spider. Okay? And then that would, that would evoke a, a fear response that would amp them up. And then, then you relax them again. And you get them to the point where they can hear the word spider and still feel relaxed. And then once that's established, you can uh, turn up the heat a little. And now maybe once they're in that relaxed state again, you show them a picture of a very small spider, maybe a cute one. And uh, that would elicit their fear again. And then you would help the person relax and repeat that until the point that they can look at this picture of the cute spider and not feel upset. Once you've achieved that, turn up the heat again, and maybe you can um, condition them to feel relaxed when they see a picture of a meaner looking spider. And you can do this with folks so they get to the point where, you know, they're okay with, say, even touching a spider. Um, the Conditioned compensatory response is a conditioned response that's the opposite of the unconditioned response. Its function is to compensate for the unconditioned response. Here's an example. Your body has a counter-regulatory response to, to drugs that affect it. A common one is, is alcohol. And what alcohol functions to do is depress your nervous system. But your body learns that and, and you develop a tolerance. That tolerance, your body kind of fighting back, is a conditioned response that's elicited by cues in the environment that tell the body, okay, that the drug that it needs to resist is about to come at it. Those cues are in the environment that the person uses the drug in. So addicts who die of an overdose um, often didn't take a larger dose than, than what they're used to, right? They know their way around dosing. What often happens is that they take the usual dose in a new environment. And the fact that they're in a new environment means that their body's counter-regulatory response isn't getting triggered. And so the drug has its, its full effect and their, their tolerance doesn't kick in, right? And so the effect of the drug is much stronger than they expected. And conditioning is, is one of the reasons that, you know, rehab doesn't always work. 
Because people can learn to be sober in this new and distinctive environment that looks a certain way and smells a certain way and has certain routines. Okay, like, okay, they can do that. But but what happens when they come back home? Right, home to the, say, the apartment that has all the cues that they associate with using. Right, like, let's say that's the, the cushy armchair that they sat in while using. And that's the blanket they used. Okay, and so those are going to trigger responses in the body that, you know, they might experience as as cravings. So it's best if people who are coming out of a rehab, like will move into a new place. Another example of a condition compensatory response is uh, called anticipatory nausea and vomiting, something that happens to people who are getting chemotherapy, which can make people feel um, very ill. And so the nausea becomes conditioned to to the environment, so people can have a a reaction just to to the seeing the the chemotherapy environment. But because of um, well biological priming, which we'll talk about later, um, they they also tend to condition that nausea to foods that they ate. Okay. Like, what was the last thing that, that they ate before getting the chemotherapy? Because we have a biological predisposition to associate illness with food. And so a, a technique that um, that might be used is, is called eating a scapegoat food. So let's say there's a food that, that um, the person doesn't particularly like or need to have in their life, like uh, grape flavor lollipops. Okay. Every time, um, you know, you know, have a, a grape flavored lollipop half an hour before the chemotherapy and then let that let the conditioning affect grape lollipops, which we don't really need or or want our diet anyway. Okay? And that scapegoat food can save the other foods in their diet that they need to eat in order to stay as healthy as they can. Uh, disgust reactions to food or drink can be established using classical conditioning. Um, an example is um, disulfram, which is known as antabuse. If you take disulfram and drink any amount of alcohol, you will be violently, violently ill. And so that can teach people not to like um, the taste of alcohol. So there's there's some value to that. It's um you know it's not a, a complete cure because people know about this pairing, and uh, and cognition does matter because they can stop taking it and then um, go back back to using. But some some folks find it helpful. Now, your uh, textbook takes the position that um, fetishism seems to be due to classical conditioning. And, and that kind of caught my interest. They, because they tell the story of a study where they were able to get male quails to mate with a terry cloth cylinder. And so what they did is they paired the presentation of the receptive female quail with um, this terry cloth cylinder. And I can't tell whether they, um, you know, exactly how they did that. Um, I mean, is that, I can't tell in that picture, is that the female quail in the terry cloth cylinder or did they put, did they make it look like that? But what they are suggesting is that fetishes are a result of stimuli that are paired with with sexual experiences. And I I'm not completely convinced. I'm thinking that, um, you know, that terry cloth cylinder is a bit shaped like a girl bird. And, and this is a bird with a bird brain. Like, you know, can you blame him? Um 
Uh, there's a question from Kennedy there. Why is it just non-living things? So fetishes are defined as, I think, is sexual attraction to... I'm wondering, is it non-living things? I think that's what your textbook says it is. But when I went and, and Googled the definition, I, I saw one definition that said it was like non-traditional things. And a fetish is um, a paraphilia. And I'm aware that, you know, one kind of paraphilia is pedophilia. And that's, you know, children are living. I don't think that's considered a fetish. So I believe the definition in your text is that it's an attraction to to non-living things, to inanimate objects. But yeah, that's not what I found when I went and Googled it. So they might not be using the right definition. And here's an example. Um, I've read that the most common fetishes are feet. Right? Feet are living things. Hopefully. Okay. Um, yeah, it's most people who have fetishes are male. That's predominantly men. And the most common fetish is, is the foot fetish. But the foot isn't the first thing that a heterosexual man would notice about a woman. Right? Like usually they're in shoes. So if this is true this theory, then wouldn't we expect that, you know, men would have eye fetishes? Because isn't that the first thing you notice about a person when you look at their, at their eyes or maybe their hair? So I'm, I'm not, I'm not completely convinced about this. Other common fetishes are um, shoes, undergarments. I can understand undergarments, um, latex, but, you know, what if, I've never heard of anyone having a, a fetish for condoms, and those are frequently paired with with sex. So uh, I was a little bit uncertain about this, and um, I found an example of somebody with with a paraphilia. And so I'll, I'll I'll play this video, and while you watch this, think you know is this is this classical con is classical conditioning the whole story here? And now, um, I guess you guys were able to hear the, the beeping before. So let me know if my computer sound isn't set up properly. So does classical conditioning explain that? There is um, another clip that um, I, I forgot to embed it there where he has a, a conversation with a therapist of, of some kind. And um, he mentions that, you know, he has tried to have relationships before, like maybe he's had some girlfriends, but it it just didn't um, really work out because of his attraction to things. And so before this, he had been attracted to, uh, you know, other metal objects like bicycles, and um, I, I, I don't know what, what, what do you guys think? Is there a role for for classical conditioning? Do you think he ended up like that because of of classical conditioning? Maybe. Um, the, the reason I'm I'm skeptical is because he re reports kind of an, an early attraction to this, kind of like around puberty. He's, you know, interested in in bicycles, and uh, there isn't really like when would a a car be okay? I can see how like you know parking is a thing, and that maybe a car could be conditioned to sex, but it should be a um, what do we call those stimuli that are so common that you can't. Um, you can't, they don't pair well. Yeah, late. you should be seeing latent inhibition because there's so many cars all around so that even if a car was paired with, with sex for somebody because they had sex in a car, um, we'd expect latent inhibition to, to prevent the car from becoming a um, conditioned stimulus. 
and and uh, Shelby wrote, this reminds me of the Reddit post where the guy was only attracted to an imaginary humanoid cockroach being who eventually thinks he's married to and, and shares a mind with. Uh, there are um, many real life examples of objectophilia, which is an, an orientation towards objects. And, and there is a woman who married her, her briefcase. Um, there's a woman who married a, a railway station. Um, there's a pro golfer who married the Eiffel Tower. Um, there's a question in, in the chat. Isn't there an association with the color red and sexuality? And yes, there is research demonstrating that heterosexual men find a rated an image of a woman as more attractive when she was wearing a red t-shirt than a than when she was wearing a blue t-shirt so they they took a picture of of took pictures of women and then used uh, the computer to change the color of of what she was wearing and got um heterosexual men to rate the picture for attractiveness and yes there seems to be something about red so there the woman's rated as more attractive when she's wearing red Ah, and another comment in the chat. Uh, I guess the car is male, so that can't explain it. I, I wondered about that. He seems to um, treat, I mean, the car is a thing, so so it can't, it doesn't have a gender, but he's certainly projecting a gender onto the car. And um, you couldn't really say that Chase is gay, though, because that, you know, gay men like other human men, not not cars. And so he he's created this male gender for the car, but he seems to the way he treats the car is very much the way that heterosexual men kind of traditionally treat um, the, the the woman that they love. Like he wants to protect Chase. Uh, he brings Chase gifts. He um, he knows when Chase is having a bad day. He'd be very upset if any anyone did anything bad to Chase. Like it, it seems like. The, the instincts that, that he's having seem to be very characteristic of a kind of traditional male towards female relationship. Um, question there is that less like conditioning, more like delusion. There's definitely a component of delusion there because he he thinks that that Chase is a person with with feelings or he's he's personified Chase to, to the point that he thinks that Chase is really in in a relationship with them and responding and, and having feelings uh, personification is something that human brains do if when you were a child you probably had a stuffed animal that you personified it's really actually a stuffed animal it's an inanimate object but you might have been very attached to it and had all kinds of stories about it and maybe you'd wince at the thought of it being hurt um personification is is very common but he's like taking it to to an extreme <laughs> Nelson wants to put Chase into a car crosher. <laughs> that that would really, really hurt Nathan. Um, there's another question. Is this condition a psychological problem? Excellent question. Um, fetishes are not considered a problem, like a psychological disorder, unless they cause... A problem in your life and you could see that maybe this this could cause a problem in um in in nathan's life and then um i believe they're called paraphilias at that point so if they cause harm but lots of people have um fetishes and then they you know they still have healthy relationships so people can can get by in life and and have good relationships with others then we don't uh we don't need to pathologize that. Um, I'm aware that um, there can be relationship issues with um, when men with foot fetishes, like a, a foot is a, a living thing. Uh, it comes attached to to a woman. But I what I've heard is that um, the women who are attached to the feet can feel very, very left out because it's just like all about the feet and the foot worshiping and that can that can be a, a disappointing experience perhaps so if you're a foot fetishist remember that the foot comes attached to a person who who wants to feel um cared about all right 
Um, we are now at um, 1019 and I will pick up next class with um, operant conditioning. And I'll stop the recording here and I'll stick around in case there are any other questions.